Take your Bibles and open up to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is what we're going to look at uh, this morning. Glad you're here uh, to, uh, uh, to worship and uh, to look at God's Word and uh, hope to encourage you with that. We've been talking about uh, new things in uh, the new year. That's one of the uh, kind of themes that we've uh, kicked the the year off with. Today is Prove the Tithe uh, Sunday. That's not an extra offering. It's just we've encouraged you. You got a letter from me and encouraged everybody to tithe. If you've never done it, it's one of those places. It might be a new thing for you in the new year to begin obeying what God's Word says about giving a tithe back to Him, to the storehouse. And I hope you'll be a part of that uh, as many uh, try it every year when we emphasize this for the very first time and discover it really does work. Uh, what God's Word said is true. And so I hope today you'll participate in that. And maybe it's a new thing or maybe it's a renewed thing for you. But we've been talking about new things in the new year and how to have a better year and, and uh, in particular how to have a, uh, a better year or a better life spiritually. And so this morning, you see the title of the message is Your Greatest Need in the New Year. What is your greatest need in the new year? How would you answer that uh, question? uh, And how would you fill in a blank like this? uh, uh, In your heart, at least, answer it. I need more in the new year. What is it that you need more of? There are many things I guess you could fill in in that blank with. You, You might put something like this. Well, I need... I need more skill in some area of my life. It may be in parenting. If you're a parent, you may say, I need more parenting skill. Or you might say, I need more skill communicating. I I don't communicate as well as I'd like. Or it may be something in your work, some vocational skill that you feel like you need more of. Or maybe you'd say, hey, I need more finances in the new year. I bet that's one for uh, most everybody here. Uh, I need more of that. Or you might answer, say, I need more time. Can I get a witness on that one? I need more time. You know, it just doesn't seem like there's enough time. Or maybe you'd say, I need more rest. How about that one? You know, or or I need more energy. Maybe you'd say, that's what you need. Or maybe you would say, I need more patience. I need more patience. I've been driving on the circle too much. (laughs) Or it might be something like this. I need more commitment. I know there's some things that I need to be more committed to. I, I just need more commitment or... Or maybe you need some more discipline. There's some areas of your life where you say, I need more discipline or more accountability or I need to take more responsibility or I don't know. You could fill in that blank, I guess, with a thousand different things and, and I don't know what your answer would be and nothing wrong with any of those if you need more of those But whether you realize it or not, I know something about what you need. I know that there is one thing all of us need more than anything else. And I put a blank on uh, there for uh, you to write in the answer. What, What is your greatest need in 2023? I know what it is because it's my greatest need as well. It's above every other need that you could list or fill in the blank with. And the need is this. Your greatest need is more God. Your greatest need is more God. No matter what areas you need, you have needs in, your greatest need is uh, more God. I read recently about an event where Will Graham, the grandson of Billy Graham, uh, this was a few years back before uh, Billy Graham died, but uh, they had had Jim Cimbala. Jim Cimbala, the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York, was preaching at the Billy Graham Conference Center, the Cove, and Billy Graham told his grandson, I want to meet him, bring him up here to the house, I'd like to meet him. And so Will took um, Jim Cimbala uh, to to meet uh, uh, Billy Graham. And the story went that when he arrived there, um, Will said, Grandpa Bill, uh, Pastor Jim Cimbala's here, and and he's been preaching uh, at the the Cove each evening. And and he said to his grandfather, he said, uh, And he preached a message last night that really blessed me, to which Dr. Graham raised his head and said, what was his message? And Will filled him in on the message. He kind of told him a a kind of a synopsis of it. And then he went on and he said this. He said, Grandpa Bill, Pastor Jim preached from Mark chapter 3 about our first calling in life. And he reminded us that our first calling, no matter how busy we are, 
Uh, even doing the work of the Lord, our first calling is that we can't lose sight uh, that we are to be with God. And uh, Dr. Graham, in a frail voice, he responded and said, um, that's a calling we need. And that before we go out, before we do anything, even as preachers or whatever, that's our, our first call is indeed to, to be with God. And from that fellowship, uh, Will said, he told his granddad, from that fellowship and communion with the Lord, everything else will flow and shape. And then he said, you know, Grandpa Bill, I have so much on my plate, I needed to hear that, because we can start running around and we can miss out on being with Jesus. And he said, suddenly, Billy Graham lifted his head uh, once again, and in a broken voice, he said to his grandson, no, Will, I needed to hear that, because I'm 96 years old, and I need to be with Jesus more. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about the premier evangelist of the 20th and really probably the 21st century, used by God around the world, probably has preached to more people than any human in history. And he said, uh, I need that. He wasn't saying, you know, that's a good point. I already know that. I don't need to be reminded of that. Instead, he was saying, no, even at 96, I need more God in my life. Well, frankly, that's our need too, isn't it? We need more God, more growth, more spiritual maturity. And so today, with that in mind, what I want to show you are are a few things about growth and maturity, a few things about how to have more God in your life in the coming year. If you're physically able to do so, why don't you stand with me as we read our passage this morning from Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11. Follow along, if you will. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, Lord, I pray that this morning you'll help us to understand Enlighten our hearts and enlighten our eyes spiritually, Father, so that uh, we can hear what you have to say to us. And Lord, uh, not only let us hear it in our minds, but Father, let us hear it in our soul. He that has ears, let him hear, Father, what your Spirit has to say. And so speak to us, we pray. Uh, We're listening. And then Father calls us to obey you in whatever way that you may speak to us. We love you and we thank you for your word now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Let me just give you a little kind of insight about this passage, what's going on. In verses 11 and 12, they point to four specific giftings or callings. And when you get saved, you get spiritual gifts. Now, your natural abilities or talents are really gifts from God too, but you have a spiritual dimension of your life when you get saved, you get spiritual gifts. And then there are some distinct spiritual callings or gifts, if you will. And in this case, he refers to, uh, he gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. Why? For the purpose of, of equipping the saints, he says, who, to help the saints grow, to help the saints mature, to help the saints learn to cultivate uh, their gifts. So they have gifts and responsibilities, and then these specific kinds of callings are to help the saints understand their callings and exercise their gifts Now, that doesn't suggest that these uh, four or five specific kinds of callings uh, um, are are more significant to God than the other callings. They're just a different specificity and for a uh, special purpose. And so your gifts, all of our gifts are important. By the time he ends this section, he talks about the importance of all of us working together, using our gifts, but that's a process of maturity. 
And maturity happens when you have more God in, in your life. Most of us are where we are spiritually because that's where we're willing to be. That's as far as we want to go. We don't really want to go any further. And sometimes we've been convinced, I, I think, from the enemy of our soul that, that to go any further might require stuff of us that we don't really want to have to adjust our lives to. And so the, the devil will intimidate us into thinking that where you are is the safe place. Stay where you are spiritually. But God always calls you further along. God is never content for you to be where you are spiritually. And God is never content to say, well, I've got this much of your, your life and that's enough. I, God wants all of you. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit today. Can you imagine if Jesus walked in here today? Can, you, can anyone imagine that Jesus would walk in here and say, okay, Ridgecrest, you got a measure of spiritual health, and we do. You got a measure of spiritual health. Stop it. Stop growing. Enough. Okay, I've had enough of you. <laughs> you can't imagine Jesus doing that, can you? You can't imagine him saying, Y'all have grown enough. And you can't imagine Jesus saying, Now, compared to this place or compared to these Christians, you're pretty good. So just relax, cool it, cool your jets, don't go any further. You can't imagine him saying it because the reason you can't imagine that is you know he wouldn't do it, right? You know, actually, if Jesus walked in here, and I've said this before, if Jesus were your pastor, our church would probably be a lot smaller because Jesus would bring expectations to us that many people would say, no, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm into that. But so the fact is... God wants you to have more of him, but God does not force himself on us. So how are we going to have more God uh, in this, this year? Well, I think Paul gives us some insight as he's speaking to the church at Ephesus. He gives us some insights that will help them experience more God. And I want to pass that on to you uh, this morning. First of all, I want you to see he begins with the reason for maturity. What is the reason for maturity? He tells us in verses 13 and 14 to, to, uh, until we can grow into being mature, a mature man so that we're no longer, notice he says, that we're no longer children tossed to and fro. So spiritually we mature. You have a, a season of spiritual immaturity and there is always a sense in which we are never arriving at spiritual maturity, but we should be progressing it's, you might say from season to season. So when you were, Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a, ch a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child. But he said, when I became a man, I began to uh, I act and think like a man. And so, and he's using that in the context of spiritual growth. And so, uh, if you're still spiritually uh, a spiritual child, you're not making much progress. Now. You know, being a child is a fun thing. Maybe you can recollect some, you know, you don't have a lot of responsibility as a child. Everybody kind of uh, helps do things for you. You just kind of, kind of, uh, life is fun. Life is easy and that sort of stuff. And, and uh, it's because somebody's making it happen. But those people that are making it happen are doing so to help you get to a place where you can function on your own, right? All right? So that's what God wants you to do. He wants you spiritually to be able to function in a more mature level. And so he, he talks about the reasons for that. There was a, an occasion, a, a story is told about Albert Einstein in his latter years, and he was having a dinner with a, a neighbor family, and they had, a, they had a, a, a young lady in the family, and she asked the white-haired scientist the question. She said, so what are you actually, what are you actually uh, in your profession what what is your profession what is you is it that you do and Einstein answered her and said well he said I devote myself to the study of physics I devote myself to the study of physics and 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 the young lady looked at him in astonishment and she said you mean you study physics at your age and then she said I took that course years ago I've already finished well, she didn't get what he was saying, but you know, the story's kind of interesting because the reason many Christians are spiritually weak is because in their mind, they finished the journey, so to speak, with Jesus a long time ago, and what they've done is they've treated spiritual maturity and spiritual growth, they've treated it more like it was a course to take and complete rather than a lifelong journey. 
And Paul, so Paul answers the question here about the reason that spiritual maturity is important and growth is so important. He says that maturity does some things for us. Number one, it creates spiritual unity. He says unity of the faith until we all grow up into a mature man and unity of the faith. You see, immature Christians are almost always divided. They're divided in their hearts. They're divided in their life, you know, which is one of the reasons that we need to grow up. Have you ever used that phrase with someone or about someone? They need to grow up. Why? Because their life is kind of disjointed and that sort of thing. They need to grow, grow up or, or that sort of thing. Well, you know, I'm afraid sometimes God would look at, at us and go, you need to grow up because, because immaturity keeps your soul divided. And le- let me tell you this, immaturity will cause division in a church. I won't say this is always the reason, but you find a church that is divided and you can almost always, sooner or later, trace it back to spiritual immaturity. I've done this long enough to know that almost always, if you find division in a church that is hostile, I don't mean disagreements, we can disagree in the family of God, provided we disagree agreeably. Now, we don't disagree on core doctrinal issues, we, you can't do that, but but, uh, but if you look at a church that is divided, you'll almost always be able to trace it back to spiritual immaturity, believers that are just not mature and more, are probably more self-centered and self-focused than kingdom-focused. <clears throat> but Paul tells us right here that maturity is important because it creates spiritual unity. It puts us on the same page. Now, Augustine, St. Augustine said this, And by the way, you may think, who is Augustine? One of the church fathers. You ought to go read some of City of God by Augustine or Augustine's Confessions when Augustine got saved. I mean, it's his story. You you ought to read that. uh, You know, you used to have to read stuff like that. It used to be actually required reading in some cases. But you ought to read uh, something like Augustine's Confessions. He was a bad dude before he got saved. But Augustine became this brilliant scholar, and he wrote, and one of the things he wrote said, in the non-essential things of our faith, we have liberty. In other words, there's some things that we can have liberty. We don't agree completely on, but we can have liberty in. But he said, in the essential things, the doctrines, Paul talked about not being tossed by every kind of fad or doctrine out there. He said, in the essential doctrines, we have unity. We may have we have liberty in some things that it's, it, it is not a test of orthodoxy if we agree or not. But he said, in the essential things of our belief, we have unity. So we have liberty, and then we have unity. And then he says, but in all our beliefs, we show charity. I mean, we don't try to kill each other, other uh, over those things. But So Paul says that, that to us, that maturity creates a kind of a, is, it's a unifying force. That's why you need to grow up in the faith. But he also says that maturity produces spiritual stability. Notice he used the phrase not tossed about or, or thrown by the wind or driven by the wind, depending on your translation. He says not tossed about. Maturity produces spiritual stability. And that's one of the reasons you need to grow uh, up in your faith is so that you will have a stability that keeps you. By the way, if you do not have a maturing, a maturing faith, because it's always, it should always be maturing, you will find yourself at times uh, feeling very unstable but because of all the different things that are. And, we're, and have you noticed this, that the culture will try to tell Christians how they ought to live? Do you all ever get that? You ever realize that the messages of the culture is to try to tell even the church how it's supposed to respond to things, how it's supposed to to live, how it's supposed to form its convictions, and what it will do subtly and sometimes overtly is it will try to to push its convictions on the the people of God, and the people of God will swallow that. You know why they swallow it? Because they're immature. Because... They're driven and tossed by the waves of the cultural doctrines of the world. And they say, well, the world says this. And you, I know, but that was old stuff years ago. And so we, we have progressed beyond that and beyond what the Bible says. You understand what's going on? There's a programming process that happens. And one of the most distressing things about spiritual immaturity is spiritual immaturity will swallow things that the culture tells them it ought to swallow when God says it shouldn't. 
And that's one of the, the, the ironclad tests to, to reveal where you are spiritually is if you drink in the message of the culture when that message defies what God has already said. And we don't even process it like that. By the way, the devil is never going to throw it at you or throw that kind of message at you and go, I want to tell you, here's a message that is distinctly contrary to the Word of God, so I'm going to throw it at you. But he knows better than that. He's going to be subtle, and so you're going to be bombarded. You're, all kinds of messages that eventually cause you to go, uh, 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 yeah, I guess, I guess because they say that this is how we ought to operate and how we ought to um, we ought to think and believe, then we adopt the thinking uh, with, little, with little understanding of what is, how, how is that thinking compared to what God's thinking is. Am I making sense? And so spiritual maturity, you know what it does? It produces stability so that we're not thrown around by all the things that, that happen out there. And by the way, that also includes a lot of stuff that is, happens inside the kingdom of God that is not of God but happens inside, uh, an infiltration, you might say, uh, within and, and becomes a fad in the church and those sorts of things. So we have to be very careful with that. But well, how, how do we avoid being tossed about by all of these different things, outside, inside? Paul says we avoid that by growing, by maturing, by growing up into a mature man or woman spiritually. And then he says that maturity protects us from doctrinal fads. Every wind of doctrine, these winds blowing about, there's always something blowing about. Always, listen, listen people, let me just tell you, always check it against what does God say. Always check it against what God says. Okay, so, so that's the reason we must mature uh, and then secondly, I, Paul speaks about the range of maturity. The range of maturity. And he gives us that in verse 15. Now, I think you'll understand what I mean when I use the term range. Look what he says in verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love. And by the way, that is our response. Remember what Augustine said? In the non-essentials, we have liberty. In the essentials, we have unity. But in all of our beliefs, we express them with charity. Speaking the truth in love. That's what Paul says right here. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into uh, Christ Jesus. Now, here's the phrase. If you take notes in your Bible, underline this, this phrase. To grow up, and here it is, in every way. Every way. That's the range. You got it? That's the range. Every way. Spirit, spiritual maturity and growth, it's not a selective process. By that I mean we, we don't pick and choose the areas of growth in our life, or at least we're not supposed to. We, we may do that. You may do that, but that's not the way. It is in every area. The range is every area. All of you is to be presented to uh, God. Uh, and by the way, we have a model for that, and that is Jesus. Jesus gave his all, didn't he? He didn't give part of himself on the cross. He gave all of himself uh, on the cross, and uh, when he died, uh, to save us and so we're to grow up in every way in every area we're not to pick the areas uh, more God means that God has access to everything in your life every part of you God has access to and you see a lot of times we get ourselves in trouble and the reason we don't go very far in terms of spiritual maturity is we hang on to areas of our life does that make sense so we say oh yeah he is lord of this or he's Lord of this, and he's Lord of this, but this area, I'm, gonna, I'm really not surrendering that yet. And, and sometimes it can be a, a sin area in our life. Sometimes it can be uh, something that we just refuse to, to, to believe that God knows what he's doing, that God knows best. It may be, well, today's Prove the Tithe Sunday. So it may be like, did I really trust God? Do I trust his word about giving like he's taught me and like the word of God says? And, and so we might hold back uh, in an area like that. Or you name any other kind of area of our life which we don't want him to control. But this tells us we're to grow up in every area, in every way. Uh, way. And our nature just doesn't, doesn't like that too much uh, we try to hang on to things. And when we do, here's what happens, class. We, when we do that, when we don't give him all, what we do is end up living segmented spiritual lives. 
So, so people will sometimes say, well, I want the blessing of God on my, over my life. Well, does he have, have you surrendered your life? See, well, Jesus is Lord, whatever Jesus is Lord of, Jesus blesses. But if he's not, somebody said this, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. But so if you hold things back, why would he bless the things that you're withholding from him? I mean, maybe, uh, whatever the area may be in your life, if you say, but I'm going to hang on to this, I'm going to control this because I don't want to let go of this, or I'm afraid if I surrender this place in my life to him, that he'll, he'll change things, and I don't want him to change things. And, and by the way, he might, I don't know. But I, I can tell you this, everything Jesus is Lord over in your life, he succeeds at. He succeeds at. Everything he's Lord over, uh, he's not the cosmic failure. So, so the range is every area to grow up in there. Well, now, what does that mean then? Well, it, mean, it means this. To, to grow up in every way means that God may have to use trials to grow you. He may have to. He may have to use some trials to grow you or to get you to surrender areas of your life. Maturing is a, a timely process. And Now, if you look back on your life, I think you would agree with me, you can look back on your life and you can see uh, the trials that God used to shape you. Can you do that? Do you ever look back? And you, you know, the place where you grow more than any other place in your life is uh, in those places where you had difficulties or obstacles that you had to trust God for. And I'm not saying go look for those. They, they, they'll be there. Either God will allow trials if he needs to shape you in an area, or sometimes he will bring a trial into your life. Did you know that? The Bible says God tested Abraham. And so sometimes God will bring, but what, the whole purpose is to get you to mature and and. And often the purpose is to get you to let go. And the only way he can do that sometimes in order to grow you and so that he can have more of you and you can have more of him is that he may bring some trial in your life. I remember uh, many years ago in my ministry, I served out west. And uh, we had a remarkable ministry and God was doing stuff there and it was God doing it, you know. I've been fortunate because I've, I've been... I've been in a number of ministries that God was working in, and I just got to kind of go along for the ride. And uh, this was really, uh, God was blessing and affirming the ministry that we had. It was to students, and uh, I still hear from those students. This is 30-something years ago, and I still hear from those students, uh, some of those students to this day. They're not students anymore. Uh, one of them is executive vice president of American Airlines. And I mean, and they still love God, and it's a good thing. We had a, a wonderful ministry. But uh, I have to tell you, it was a real struggle for me, not because of the students, but because of the leadership I was under. And I'm going to be real careful how I say that, because of the leadership I was under. And I, I tell you, just had no respect for the leadership I was having to serve under. And so at any rate, uh, the Lord called us away from them there for, after a few years, and and um, um, I asked the Lord at the next place that he took us to, I said, Lord, what was that all about? Because, again, we had a great ministry there, but, man, I just, well, you heard what my struggle was. I said, Lord, what was that all about? And the Lord whispered in my heart, and this is what he said, I, wanted, I, had to, I took you there to teach you something. I want to teach you what I don't want you to ever be in ministry. I said, that makes sense. So God was using something that was hard to teach me something that was good that he would use to shape me, to grow me, to help mature me. God does that sometimes. He'll allow those trials. Um, you see, God has to be given lordship over all. And we struggle because it's just hard for us to let go. And sometimes we'll do this, we'll call him Lord, Lord, Lord. You know, Jesus addressed some people that called him Lord, and he said this to him, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do, and not do the things that I've asked you to do? You see, it's one thing to, to call him Lord, it's another thing to allow his Lordship to rule over my life and all of the areas of my life, and those are two different things. 
So growing up in every way means you obey Him in everything. Why? Because you trust Him. And so you don't just call Him Lord, you yield your life to His authority over all the areas of your life. And I want to ask you this morning, uh, in your heart of hearts, is there some area you're withholding from God? God, you can have this and this and this and this and this, but this, I'm just not really ready to give that up. Is there some area in your life that you're withholding from God? I want to tell you something, you will struggle to mature spiritually if you're withholding from the one who did not withhold anything. God has a right, by the way, to deal with the things that prevent your growth. Did you know that? If you're his child, if you're saying, he has a right to deal with the things that will keep you from maturing and growing and having more of him. And, and by the way, uh, God will sometimes discipline you. And God is not picking on you if he disciplines you in areas that he's trying to, to move you through and move you away from and move you out of. Why? He wants you to have more of him and he wants you to keep on growing. Actually, it's the act of a loving father when he does that. I see my child, I want my child to mature, I want them to grow into the full measure, as he says in the passage, into a full uh, uh, knowledge of who I am. The Bible says, for the one the Lord loves, he disciplines uh, and chastises every son, every child who uh, who, uh, he receives. And and the writer of Hebrews tells us that it is for discipline that you have, you have to endure discipline. And when you do, God is treating you like a son or a daughter. And then he asks this question rhetorically, what son or daughter is there whom his father does not discipline? Every sane parent understands this. They understand the need for correction. They understand the need for discipline in a child. By the way, that's only for children. It doesn't, it doesn't apply to grandkids. Amen. But every, every sane parent understands the need for discipline and correction. But they do it if they, if they understand it. They do it out of love and they do it from a desire to teach and to grow their child. Only a dysfunctional parent doesn't get it. Only a dysfunctional parent doesn't understand the necessity of discipline or the, the misapplication Uh, of discipline but listen God is not a dysfunctional parent he's not a dysfunctional father he's a perfect father and so when he disciplines us it's for our growth it's for our maturity so we can experience more of him it's not to to uh, get back at us God doesn't operate in revenge there is a day coming when there will be judgment and there will be wrath but that'll be something we brought on ourselves, not something God says I'm I'm trying to get you back he, and, and by the way, God doesn't have to explain himself when he disciplines us. God doesn't have to explain why. And we may never know on some occasions until we get to heaven. Our daughter, you know, uh, when I, when, before I had, we, had, we had kids, kid, I thought growing up, Wally, I just thought I will never use this phrase with my kid one day or kids, you know. Because, who said it? So I heard somebody say it over there. Because I said so. When I was a kid, I hated that. My parents said, why? I said, why? Because I said so. I thought, that is lame. <laughs> Until I became a parent. And then I thought, that's a really great line. And I used it. I invoked it. Just because I said so. And I can remember our daughter in her teen years, in her younger teen years, and she'd ask, Dad, can I do something? And, and I would say, no. That's an, another good phrase that I learned, no. But Daddy, no, you're not, you're not doing that. Why not, Daddy? And you know what I would say, because I said so. And then one day the Lord gave me a new statement. And I will never go, we were, she was a, uh, a I think she was 15. We were driving home one Sunday. She always rode home from here, Ridgecrest. And she was driving home with me. And uh, she asked about something. I said, no, sweetheart, I'm not going to do that. She said, but, Daddy, why not? And she was not a rebellious uh, child. But she asked, like any teenager, but, Daddy, why not? 
And here's what the Lord gave me. I promise this is from the Lord. You can use it. I give parents, if you're parents, you have permission to use this. It might not be the time right now, but hang on to it. You can use this down the road. And this is what I said to her. I said, and this, I, I thank the Lord put this in my heart. I looked at her and I said, sweetheart, I said, this may come as a shock to you, but I'm smarter than you are. <laughs> Isn't that a great line? Don't you write that down if you're a young parent because you will use that one day. And it's true. And I said, because I'm smarter than you are. And she goes, no, oh, Daddy. I said, no, it's true. And I said, this is really going to blow you away. Your mother is smarter than you are too. Oh, Daddy. And so, but she got the message that I, I know better than she does. Uh, and that's why I can say no to some things. Okay? So, from that point forward, anytime she'd ask and I'd say no, I'd say no. And at first she would still question, but why, Daddy? And I'd say, because I'm smarter than you are. Oh, Daddy. Finally, it got to the point where she would ask and I'd say, no, sorry, sweetie, no. And I'd say, you want to know why? And she would do this, I know, you're smarter than I am. And I'd say, you got it. Well, now listen. Now, I'm not sure that's true anymore, but, but at least at that time, I was. And I told her, I said, I may not always be, but right now I am. I want to tell you something. God is smarter than you and me. And that's why the, He has the right to say no. And you and I, we can say, but God, why? And the answer is because God's smarter than you are, and He doesn't have to explain Himself. Really, God can say Just because I said so. Do you remember what Jesus said before he left the disciples? He said, there are many other things I would like to say to you, but you cannot handle them. You know what he was saying? I'm smarter than you are. I'd like to tell you, explain, but you would not understand if I explained it. So, what is he saying? He's saying, trust me. Trust me. All right. God is smarter than us. He knows what's best for us, and He knows what we need and what we do not need that will help us grow up in every way. And then here's, here's a, a, the third thing I want you to see, the results of maturity. Let me quickly do this, because I want to close by giving you four things that will help you get more of God in your life. What are the results of maturity? Well, verse 16 says, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Why is spiritual growth and maturity necessary? Why is it that you need more God? Well, the answer is because when you mature, not only do you grow up in God, but guess what? You help the entire church grow. Your growth is important to the health of the entire church. Now, it is so it is both personal, it's important to you and your walk with God, but it also adds to the value and the health of the body of Christ, all of us together. It's necessary. For that reason, Um, so whatever spiritual body part you are, and all of us are, be that part, whatever part you are. That's the subject of another message. I haven't preached on that in a while, but one day I'll, I'll talk about that again. So be the part that you are, because all of us working together create health, our own spiritual health, but the health of of the body and it causes us to make an impact on those around us and that's the body of Christ it is supposed to operate uh, uh, as a dependency every one of us growing every one of us maturing and then joining in with one another to show the heart of God through us My wife said something one time after our grandsons, uh, the birth of our grandsons, but it's a great description. She said, you know, when I look at them, it's like my heart has grown legs and is running around. Isn't that a good description? I thought about that. I thought, that is really, I wish I'd have thought of that. But you know, friend, That's what you are to be. You're to be the heart of God running around on two legs. 
That's what you and I are to be. We're to be the heart of God running around on two legs, a reflection of our relationship to Him. You and I, we may have a lot of needs this year, but none of us have a greater need than more God. Would you agree with that statement? We need more God. And I think the best way to do that is to to look at what what made the early church so powerful and influential. Have you ever read the formation of the church, the book of Acts, and especially the early chapters, the whole book is about how the church took off and everything but have you ever have you ever read uh, what it was have you ever uh, chapter two if you want to open your bible to chapter two of acts and i'm going to go real quick here but i want to give you i want to show you what made the church i've had this thought before maybe you have too it seems like to me the early church had a lot more god about it than we do today i mean when you read it I mean, they were gathering together, and they didn't have all the books that told them how to do it all and all that sort of stuff. And it says when they gathered, 3,000 were added to the church, and 5,000 were added uh, to the church. You know, I'm afraid today if we gave an invitation and we had 3,000 people respond to the invitation, I'm afraid we'd have an element saying, oh, this is going to take a long time. You know? Why did they have more of God? Why does it seem like that? I think they did, and I think there are some reasons that can help us have more of God in our personal lives. And here's why I want you to have more of God and me to have more of God this year, because if you do and I do, we do. Right? So four things I want to close with. Number one, here's a pattern. You can look at the early church. You can study the early church, and you can see why God was moving so powerful among them. The first thing you need more of is you need more time in worship. There are pattern. Acts 2.1 says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, look, they were all together in one place. They had gathered together. They were all there in one place. I, I want to tell you something. You say, well, they didn't have media and everything. I know that, but that's, the emphasis is not on, on that. The emphasis is on they were, and there was a reason they wanted to get together because they were having fellowship Acts 2.46, if you go on, it says, listen to this, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And day by day, they were gathering at the temple. Uh, They were gathering at the temple to worship God. Can you imagine if I said, Rich Chris, in 2023, five days a week, we're going to have services here at night. Come. You would say... Pastor, Sunday, maybe Wednesday, but you've lost it. I won't be there. And if you start putting pressure on me to be there, I'm just going to go somewhere where they don't. Now, y'all breathe easy. We're only going to go to four services a week. (laughs) No, we're not going. But do do y'all get what I'm saying? It says day by day they were gathering in the temple to worship, and then here's how we know they were Baptist. When they finished, they went to each other's houses and ate together. They were Baptists. That's how we know, because they, they had worship and then they had food. Uh, and, and so, but the, the worship thing was so important. And I want to tell you this. We need this more than we realize, I'm afraid, today. There are shifts going on in our culture. There's, there, there is a, a growing um, animosity toward the church of God in this culture and we've already seen we we experienced you know the COVID thing already uh, by the way thinned out our ranks across the nation I just came from a meeting that's why well, I wasn't here by the way Chase did a great job last week but I, I was at a large church round table there are a group of about 30 of us that meet from all over the country large churches and all of them are saying the same thing man COVID thinned thinned our our, our church out and um, I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, my tendency is to say it's bad. But my point is, we've already seen how, how the church itself can be terrified to the point of closing down and shutting down. And now we, we, I think we all did what we did for the right reasons and motivations and all of that. And that isn't what this is about. But, but I tell you what it did to me. It caused me 
to think if that can shut us down what's the next thing with the growing hostility and animosity to the church it is conceivable in your lifetime there will be forces that begin to tell us you cannot meet because you don't accept the cultural agenda in your lifetime with your kids I believe it's possible that we're going to see that. That's why worship is so important. Gathering is so important. While we can, well, you need this year more worship. I'm not trying, by the way, I'm not trying to guilt you into anything. I'm not try, trying to scare you into anything. I'm just telling you the fact is we all need more worship in our life. Would you agree with that? I, whether it's private or corporate, corporate we, we need Number two, you need more time in His Word this year. Acts 2, verse 42. This whole chapter is about the origination of the church. Notice that it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and by the way, and the fellowship. The fellowship was the body. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Uh, you need more of God's Word in your life. How do we navigate the days that we're, I'm just talking about, how do we navigate these days without, without having access to what does God say and devoting ourselves to the teaching of God's Word? How do we navigate this? You need more time in His Word. And only you can, can make that happen in your life. Well, only you can make any of those. God won't make, any, make you do any of these things, but you need more of His Word in your life. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my, my path, is what, what uh, the Bible teaches us. And so you need more of His Word in the coming year. Well, uh, let, let me move on. Number three, you need more time in prayer, Acts 2.42. Again, so not only were they devoted to the, the teaching of, uh, of Scripture, they were devoted to prayer. They prayed. What a privilege it is to talk to the Creator. People say this, I don't know how to pray. Well, I want to tell you something. It's real simple. You know, they didn't have seminars on prayer. They didn't have books on prayer. There are lots of books on prayer, and they're good books. I have a lot of them in my library and everything. They didn't have courses on prayer. There are courses on prayer. Nothing wrong with any of that. We've done uh, prayer seminars here, and we do special prayer events here, and we're going to continue to do that kind of stuff. But do you know how you become proficient in praying? By praying. And by the way, don't worry. You say, well, I, you know, I don't really know what words, but just open your heart up to God. By the way, you don't scare Him when you do that. He doesn't, you, you pour something out and you say, I, God didn't go, oh, I didn't know that. Or God doesn't start wringing his hands and say, whoa, that's enough, whoa, whoa, too much information. God doesn't do that. You just open your, you, God loves it when you open your heart up to him. And you say, but I just don't know. Just tell him what's on your heart. You're praying for them. Say, I don't know how to pray. Do you know sometimes when I'm praying for someone, I say, God, I don't know how to pray for them. So, Father, uh, whatever it is that is needed in their life right now, Father, that's what I offer up to you on their behalf. You say, does it get through? Listen, Romans tells us that none of us know how we ought to pray. But it says, but the Spirit of God takes our utterances and turns them into something that makes sense to God. So you have the Spirit of God taking your prayer and making sense out of it to the Father. Isn't that cool? You need more time in prayer. And you'll become more proficient the more you pray. And I'm not just talking about praying when you're driving around the circle. I'm talking about they had designated prayer times. Try to, try to find time. No, create time. Start shaping your life around time in the Word and time praying with God instead of trying to work them into your schedule. If you try to work them into your schedule, I promise you the devil will make sure you never have enough time to work them in. Well, I could say more, but it's time to move on. Then number four, you need more time in praise. In Acts, same chapter 2, verse 47, it says they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They were praising God. 
Um, that was a part. You want to know why they were so affected? These, these are the reasons they were so affected. And if you want more God in 2023, become more active in praise, in praising Him. The Bible says that He inhabits the praise of His people. So, guess what? What that means is God shows up when you praise. He'll show up in your life. He shows up in a congregation. Well, you know what it's like. You came in here. Some of you came in here this morning saying, okay, let's get this done. I've done my duty for the week. You know? And you got here and you actually enjoyed it. Some of you are saying, yeah, and then you started preaching and sucked all of it back out. But you got here and you, 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 and you were lifted. Your soul was lifted. Why? Because the Spirit of God inhabits the praise of His people. Wow. Think about, too, I mean, just the incredible thing it is that you and I can connect with the Creator of everything. He doesn't, He has all the time in the world to connect with you. God doesn't, we, we say, well, I, God says, I'm ready all the time, all the time for you. I love you that much. Um, when my grandsons call, I have interrupted meetings. Sorry, my grand, I, I'll be back. Why? Priority. Priority. Do you know you are priority to God when you praise him when you pray you are priority don't listen don't let that fall on a deaf ear when you go out of here you go out of here saying God thinks I'm special I don't mean egotistically but he does think you're special he created you and he gave his son to die for you you want more God this year you want more God this year? I want more God this year. I want more God. And I know if we'll do what, this, what the early church did, we'll experience more of God. And God will be pleased. I didn't say God will make it all worth everything, no problems, a year of, of nothing but prosperity. That's not what I'm saying to you. I hope you don't hear that. But what I'm saying, the more God you get, the more God you'll want. Moses, and I, I, I'll, I'll close with this. Moses, one of the, my favorite stories about Moses, after he had been leading God's people for many years, he said, God, let me see you that I might know you. God said, you can't see me and live, nobody. And, and remember, this is a pretty dynamic relationship because the Bible says that God spoke to Moses like a friend speaks to a friend. So this is a pretty dynamic relationship. And Moses said, I want to, you know what Moses was saying? God, I, wanna, I want more of you. Even though we talk like friends, I still, there's more of you I want. The more of God you have, the more of God you'll want. That's why uh, in 2023, say, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. And by the way, Moses got more. At that stage in his life, still saying, God, give me more. Why is that? Because the more you get, the more you realize there's more to get. <clears throat> and he's worth knowing. You know why? Because nobody loves you like Jesus does. When you came in this morning, you should have received the, I want us to close with this and an invitation, but you should have received the elements of the Lord's Supper. Does anybody not have these elements? Okay, uh, down here on the front, uh, stand. If you don't have, would you hold your hands up? Our guys will bring them to you if you don't have them. Up in the balcony, is everybody up there? You guys all got them? Okay. Um, now, let me give you, give you some information about the Lord's Supper, lest we forget. Um, this Lord's Supper is only for those who have trusted Jesus as their Savior. If you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, don't take this supper. The Bible says that if you do, you eat and drink condemnation to yourself. That's how serious God takes this, what this represents. So, so it's okay if you've not trusted Christ 
it's okay for you not to take this, okay? I don't care if everybody around you does. If you haven't trusted Christ, don't, don't, don't take this, okay? Uh, but if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you are more than welcome to participate in the Lord's Supper. And this is an expression of the love of God. That's, you know, what we praise Him because, we, because He loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. This is the great demonstration of His love for you. And uh, so um, we, we partake of it uh, from time to time just to remind ourselves. We don't partake of this every week. Some groups do, and I'm not fussing at them. That's their decision. But we don't do that. You know why we don't do that? We don't ever want to take for granted what this means. Oh, yeah, then now, okay, before we go, we take the Lord's Supper. And that's what, we want to understand the sacredness of this. It's a very sacred meal. And so always keep that in mind. And, and that's what Paul uh, says to us in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So take the bread, if you will. This is symbolic of his body, just as it was on that that night when they partake of the Lord's Supper. And he said, when you look, when you take this bread, you take this with the understanding that it represents my body that was broken on a cross. And when you see it, always remember, it should have been yours. It should have been your body. But I loved you so much, I gave mine. Because the payment... For sin is death. But I loved you so much, I said, I'll let my body be broken. So yours will not have to be. So every time you do it, think, wow, what an incredible. And, he, and by the way, he was God. He wasn't just a substitute for us. He was God. The Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, who came into the world, hung on the cross, and died for you the only one who could do it by the way and Paul says so just like Jesus said on that night when you partake of this bread this is my body broken for you do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me and then if you will take the cup Paul goes on to say in that same passage, in the same way Jesus took the cup after supper and saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He said this is a new covenant. You see, the old covenant had been perpetual, ongoing sacrifices. Okay, it's time for us to offer blood again. Why? Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So, you know, every year they had to go through this process. Every year they had to offer a sacrifice, a sacrifice of blood, the high priest on the altar for the people, for the sins of the people. Every year Jesus announces something. He says, this is my blood. It's a new covenant. You don't have to keep doing this every time like you did in the old covenant. This establishes a new way. But this will be the symbol of, of that new covenant this will be that blood a, a symbolic representation of that blood that was once and for all poured out for your sins and so when you see the cup remember there's a new covenant now it's a grace covenant that was purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and so as often as you drink it you remember his blood bought your salvation you know what the Bible says that when they when they uh, when he had finished that <clears throat> Paul says that you when you partake of this you proclaim his salvation until he returns what we just did is a proclamation it is a way that we say Jesus is the only way. And that will be 
because he gave his body and he shed his blood, he's the only way. And that will be true until he returns or until we go to him. Now, you say, well, that's a pretty good deal. It really is. But how do you get in on it? Well, you have to trust him as your Savior. If you're here this morning and you've never put your trust in him, before we're gone, we're going to have an invitation. I want to invite you to slip out from where you're seated in the balcony or ground floor. Come here. There will be other staff that can receive you and just say, hey, I need Christ as my Savior. You may say, well, I've been religious all my life. I've had people say to me this before. Well, I've gone to church all my life. That doesn't mean anything. So did the Pharisees. And Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. The question is not what are the appearances on the outside. What's going on on the inside? Is Christ your Savior? And if he isn't, take care of that today. Don't leave this place without taking care of that. You come and say, I need Christ as my Savior. Or I'm not sure. I want to know that I know that I know. Because I want to begin growing and maturing. I want more of God in my life. Maybe you're here this morning and you need a church family to belong to why don't you come and join say pastor i want to join i I have done that to christ my savior i just want to join the family of god here they they were a gathering they were identifiable they knew who they were and that's one of the reasons we ask you to join is you connect with us and we then can connect with you and so i want to invite you to to come if if that's where you are that you need a church church home maybe you need to be baptized you've been saved but you just have never followed through with believers baptism take care of that that's an act of obedience whatever the case may be all people have already done it this morning have confessed christ as their savior in our early service have have joined ridgecrest as their church family maybe this is that day for you maybe you just want to come and pray around the altar you're talking to god you're praying for someone praying about something praying about more god god i want more of you in my life i'm come and i'm surrendering at, at the altar whatever the case may be You come on. Are you ready? Stand, if you will. Balcony, ground floor, stand. You slip out. You come on right now. Whatever decision it is, as Bradley leads us, you come on. We're waiting.